Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Joan Zoltansky is the Chief Experience Officer for University Hospitals since January 1st, 2016. She also is a pediatric critical care physician and currently works clinically in the Pediatric Sedation Unit, Division of Pediatric Pharmacology and Critical Care Medicine, University Hospitals, Rainbows, Babies, and Children's Hospital. She is an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics here at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Dr. Zoltansky, sorry, I apologize for that. Dr. Zoltansky holds a Master's in Business Administration from Weatherhead School of Management, Case Western Reserve University. She earned her doctorate in medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, where she won the Albert L. Lewin Award for Clinical Excellence in Pediatrics in 2004. She completed a residency in pediatrics and a fellowship in pediatric pharmacology and critical care medicine at UH Rainbows Babies and Children's Hospital. She was appointed to the medical staff in 2009 and was named medical director of the pediatric sedation unit in 2012. Her research interests are pediatric procedural sedation and pediatric infectious diseases. She has authored or co-authored articles in professional journals and presented scientific abstracts at multiple national meetings. She teaches pediatric procedural sedation on a national level to advanced practice clinicians through the Society of Pediatric Sedation. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics and a member of the Society for Pediatric Sedation and Society for Critical Care Medicine. In her role as Chief Experience Officer, she works to ensure that safe, high-quality medical care is provided to patients with empathy and compassion. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Zoltansky. Well, uh, good afternoon. It's nice to be here today. I am happy to be here at the Department of Medicine. I went to, sorry, turn my phone off here. I went to medical school here and trained here, so I see a lot of familiar faces and uh, appreciate your time. So today what I want to do is talk to you about um, what we call patient experience and chat a little bit about that. There is a, there's a lot of information that we can present um, because this is an emerging thought, emerging world in your inpatient world, your outpatient world, kind of every area. And so what I want to talk about are, is there, there's this big new patient experience that we have, which is what does the patient feel and how do we engage them in their care? And then there are things that we talk about and measure and get paid on, which are surveys, patient satisfaction surveys. They're not, they're related, of course not the same thing. But I do talk about the surveys um, in here quite a bit because that's a lot of what the physicians want to talk about. There's some, you know, a lot of feelings around the surveys and how they could be better, uh, some of the good things about them, so we'll talk about some of those things. And then we'll also talk about some of the things that in the outpatient world that physicians are thinking about and paid on by your largest payer, the federal government on these. That include macro and those kinds of things that all include the patient experience. So, Patient experience. How I think about the patient experience, I'm from Rainbow, and in Rainbow, the way that I was taught about, well, to think about patient experience, you know, again, in medical school, I was taught here, I was trained here, I think I, the first place I learned this was depart from Department of Medicine doctors. When I went on the wards, and I was trained by doctors from the Department of Medicine here at, uh, at the medical center, how to talk to a patient, the importance of interacting with a patient all of their medical care. If I don't ask about their family or their work history, am I going to miss an asbestos exposure, those kinds of things. So that just beyond the signs and symptoms, how to interact with them. So I think that's really the first place I learned it. Reinforced at Rainbow, and the way that we think about it in Rainbow revolves a lot around patient safety, providing high quality care, the same that you do in the Department of Medicine. So, years in Rainbow, we went on this journey of high reliability organization. I become a high reliability organization. And in that, this is one of the, one, the studies that you see a lot of people point to. And it's basically one of the many studies that uh, in this high reliability journey, people like to point to that says, we think that medical care is not, first of all, as safe as we want it to be. And we think it's not as safe as it should be. And so medical errors, to give you some background on this, but you've probably seen some variation of that medical errors here, and this one from last year from British Medical Journal, the journal they listed medical errors as the third leading cause of death um, behind heart disease and cancer. And so when people see this, sometimes they say, is the third leading cause, maybe it's this, maybe it's not that, but basically the point being that we need to make it safer, and it's probably not as safe as we think it should be. So safety. And so this is, in Rainbow, we use this organization, HCI, and they're a nuclear scientist 
and they have taken their expertise in healthcare and they came into healthcare. Actually, I don't know if I should say by the mic if there's people. Sorry, I just remember that from this room. That there are people um, in this uh, arena that come into your organization and talk to you again about high reliability medicine. And this is the HPI slide. HPI is really the leader in healthcare of this journey to high reliability organization, and they put healthcare on this graph uh, for safety somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of bungee jumping and mountaineering. And so, is it that unsafe? I don't know, but just the point being that we need to make it safer. And so, the strategy that HPI uses um, is, I won't go into detail about this, but this is, again, the journey that we walked on Rainbow and how to make this better is listed here, um, and one of the uh, important things to see is that, I'm not sure where it is in here, but the, oh, the third, the fourth one down is that there's a deference to expertise. And we talk a lot in Rainbow that this deference and expertise is if you go into a room, there's someone who's got a white coat, there's someone who's got scrubs, there's someone in the bed, there's someone in the chair next to the bed, and actually the person who is the most expert is the person who has the most information. Sometimes that's the person in the white coat, sometimes it's the mother, sometimes it's the three-year-old patient, sometimes it's the nurse. So whoever in the room has the most information is the person that needs to be listened to. And so in that deference to expertise, if we don't provide people with a good patient experience, if we don't treat them with compassion, with empathy, people will not speak up. And that's also part of the high reliability culture is speaking up. You want people to feel empowered to speak up. You want patients to feel empowered to speak up. That's how we become a safe culture. And these are just other strategies that are similar in the high reliability journey from Robert Wood Johnson Institute of Healthcare Innovation. Um, but again, all of these have one thing in common is they rely on engaging the patient in their health care. And so a lot of this is about communication. Again, these are just some of the different strategies from those. It's about communication. And so there's some terminology that people like to use and people like to say patient experience, what is it? There's probably some continuum, and I'm not really married to one definition or another of any of these terms, but the way people kind of generally think about it is we talk about patient satisfaction. And for me, those are the surveys that somebody sends to you after you're discharged from the hospital, after you see a provider in the office. The federal government mandates that we send patient surveys because it's part of how we're paid as a provider now, as a as the hospital, but also now how providers are paid as well, is you send them a survey and say, when we'll talk about what they say, but basically how, satisfi how satisfied were they with their experience of care. Experience of care is a little bit bigger than that, and then all of these things we want to lead to patient engagement, which is ultimately for people to take action to support their health and to benefit from the care that we're providing them. And so I don't talk about money very often, um, but it is part of how we're paid. And I don't have a newer slide because this one just showed it a little bit better. But if you extend these out to 16, 17, 18, 19, the pie charts are pretty similar, is that the government, the largest payer is the federal government, and they pay you, they used to pay you only on when you saw a patient, you were paid. And that's how hospitals were paid. Well, a lot of that has changed. We've gone to value-based purchasing, and that's also now how they are paying individual providers. So when you go out and practice on your own with MACRA, you will be paid, they're starting to, and you will be paid on the total value of care. So the clinical process, patient experience, as you see, varies over the years. Sometimes it goes from 30 to 25, but it pretty stays a pretty good chunk of how uh, you're paid. And then efficiency and outcomes. So outcomes is a new one that no matter how great your process was, how did people do in the end? And so, again, just to highlight, it's also part of how we're paid. Um, just kind of a summary of what those are. And then, so, people want to talk about the surveys, and so I just like to address them up front. And so, the surveys, there are lots of different types of surveys, these patient satisfaction surveys. When a patient is admitted to the hospital, again, the federal government mandates that we send them a survey. The terms that you've probably heard is Prescani. The Prescani is our vendor that sends them. And the vendor sends them to the patient and we'll go over what they ask. But there's, there is one survey and the survey cannot be changed. So if it says capital A, the version, you cannot change it to a small a. You can't replace a comma with a period. You can't replace a period with a comma. There is only one survey that's allowed to be sent. Prescani does not create the survey. They send the survey for us. Some people add, subtract things to the survey, not subtract things, but some people add things to the survey. We as a 
system do not because the survey is already long enough. So the survey as it's sent is the only way that it can be sent by the federal government with no add-ons by us. Um, and so i just like to put this up here to point out that when people thought about the survey, the way they did it was not because people have the interpretation that the federal government said, you're going to pay based on these things and patient experience. And what the federal government actually did was said, we actually have no idea how to do it. They gave it to patient advocacy groups. They gave it to quality groups, um, which were represented by, again, Institute of Healthcare Innovation, these kind of big quality groups. And then they gave it to employers, like big employers like Ford Motor Company, and said, we don't know what the people want. You tell us. And all of these groups got together over a long period of time. And then the federal government, of course, helped them out with this. And they came up with the questions of what patients wanted. But they wanted to have the patients say what they wanted and not the federal government to say what the patients wanted. Um, went, validated it, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll talk about what they talk about or what the individual surveys are. But these are slides from Press Ganey. And I usually don't go to the vendor for information, but I did in these cases, because they have the largest database of broken down data. So they have the largest database in the country that says that these are associated. So if you have higher patient satisfaction scores, they're associated with things like um, lower readmission rates, length of stay is lower if you have higher patient satisfaction. And again, I'm not saying it's causal, because I do understand this can be a chicken and egg phenomenon, but it's associated with things that you want to happen for your patients lower pressure ulcers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so what do the surveys say? And so this is, again, often people have a lot of opinions about the survey, but the first thing that I usually find is people actually don't know what's on the survey at all. So this is what's on the survey. So the top part says HCAP, and the bottom part is TGCAP. So the top part is your inpatient survey. And these are the questions that when a patient is sent, they're not sent in this format. But this is a breakdown of what's on the survey. So the first thing that patients wanted was they wanted from their nurses to be treated with courtesy and respect. They wanted to be listened to carefully. And they also thought one of the most important things is that people explain things in a way that they could understand. So how do we, I also put in red how we work on this as a system. And so the number one way that we work on this as a system, the way that we try to improve, is for nurses to do bedside handoff. So the bedside handoff is that when a night shift nurse comes on from the day shift, instead of going to the nurse's station, which is what we've traditionally done in nursing, and you hand off and give your hand off, you go into the room and you do this in front of the patient and with the patient. Um, and this uh, sounds like somewhat simple, but it's actually very difficult to do for people that are not used to doing it. I think being from an academic institution and kind of living bedside rounds, um, especially in Rainbow, we've always done bedside rounds. You know, I, it's hard for me to imagine that someone would not do bedside rounds or have objections to bedside rounds, but lots of people do if they're not used to doing it. They have kind of the traditional questions of what if there's something private and how do we talk about information that may be embarrassing to the patient or controversial in front of the patient? And, you know, this is what you have to navigate to be a bedside provider. And so it's a good conversation to have, um, but very valuable to patients. And when this is one of the things like in the literature, if this is done consistently, this is the number one driver actually of patient satisfaction overall, because it's something that it's done, if it's done well, it's done frequently, and patients have the medical information that they need. It gets patients invested in their care. Hourly rounds is a practice um, for nurses to expect patients' needs rather than react to patients' needs. So instead of waiting for a call bell, they're going to the bedside and saying, at the hour, I am here to take you to the bathroom. Here is your pain medicine. You know, those kinds of things. Again, it's, it's something that Sounds simple to do, but since we all live in healthcare 2017, we know the importance of time. It's very difficult to do. When it's done, it's done correct and done well. It actually becomes, in the data and all the literature, it's actually a time saver um, rather than something that uses up more time. But again, very difficult to change the culture of that. Uh, the whiteboards, um, which are very important to patients, the whiteboards, if they are filled out, and then in bedside rounds, if that information is reinforced in bedside rounds, ideally the dream would be that the physicians would also use those whiteboards. When this is done well, there's a few places in the country that do this well. University of Utah is the academic leader in this. And you will see when you go there, 
the VoIP board is not just for nursing handoffs that says, where are your dentures, but it lists the plan of the care by the physician, and it lists who the physician is. The nurses talk about it, and then the doctors come back in and refer to not only the same information, but the same information in the same language, which is hugely important to patients. When you call it Lasix and I call it furosemide, it's confusing to patients. And so not only to have the same information, but to have the same language to simplify it for this complex, what sometimes we may think is simple information, but is complex medical information for patients. Um, the survey also looks at the responsiveness of staff, how quickly your call bells were answered, did you get to the bathroom as soon as you wanted it. And um, I'm not going to lie, before in this role, I never realized the importance of getting to the bathroom because nobody ever paged me to take a patient to the bathroom. But I can't tell you the amount of times now when I've gone to around in this capacity where you talk to a patient who looks pretty much like me and you, like able-bodied moving around, but for some reason they had knee surgery or some injury where they weren't able to get to the bathroom and they were, you know, incontinent, they had an accident in bed, like it's hugely upsetting to people. And again, like I'm embarrassed to say, I never realized the frequency or the importance of it, but it's it's also in people who, you know, traditionally aren't able to get to the bathroom, somebody who maybe isn't ambulatory normally, but I never realized the frequency or the importance to somebody who was, again, able-bodied walking around like you and me. Um, Seidman has taken the initiative of clarifying the expectations with people, which I think has been helpful. When people push the call button, they think that, okay, I've got to go to the bathroom, and then what they do is they don't think, like, hey, it's going to take somebody, you know, 10 minutes to get to me. They wait and think, oh, don't want to bother anybody, don't want to bother anybody, don't want to bother anybody, and then when they push it, they really have to go. So Seidman has kind of taken this initiative on of um, informing patients about these kinds of things, about the wait time that's associated with the call bell, which has been helpful. Hospital environment, <clears throat> we've looked at, um, and we've ac actually had pretty good improvements to this throughout the system in the past year. A lot of this is informing people that environmental services was there. Uh, they consistently hear the comment, my room wasn't clean, my room wasn't clean, but the room was cleaned. Uh, Pain management. Pain management this year was taken off of value-based purchasing from a payment standpoint, but the question was left on the survey. And the question was, well, you can imagine the reasons why it was taken off with the opioid crisis, um, which I think is good because I think it needs some thought around it. But it's important to remember, as most of you know, that pain has a huge halo effect. So if someone has pain that they feel is uncontrolled, it is detrimental to their whole stay, and if that is well controlled, it has a great halo effect on the rest of their stay. Um, and so there are some strategies around that, uh, but most the big strategy is having a pain conversation. I actually had a friend of mine whose mother was here on, on the medicine service, well, on the surgical service, uh, who had a gallbladder taken out, and there was a doctor that didn't know who I was. I happened to be in the room there with her. And she had a really good conversation and said, you know, you have an acute gallbladder. Until we take it out, you are going to be in pain. It's not going to get better until you go to surgery. And then it's going to start getting better a little at a time. But she actually gave her the expectation that her pain was not going to go away, and she understood that, which was really good. Communications about med. And this is where the whiteboard comes into practice, is those new medicines are written on the whiteboard and simplifying um, I've seen lots of uh, information that's been given to a patient about side effects. They can't understand when there's 12 side effects listed on a piece of paper, which one they should actually care about. Um, and as I often say, in all the medicines I've written, um, you know, usually I care about one side effect or maybe sometimes two. Every now and then it's three, but it's probably not 12. I'm probably not actively thinking about 12 side effects when I write a medicine on somebody. So. What is it that you want them to know? So writing one name for the medicine, Lasix or furosemide, whichever it is, pick it, write one medicine, write the purpose of the medicine in layman's terms, and then write one side effect for it on that whiteboard. And ideally, the dream would be that's the information the nurse is giving in bedside handoff, that's the information that the doctors are talking to the patients about as well, because what patients want is clear medical information they can understand, they can't understand what we're telling them. 
And so the doctor questions, you'll see up there that the doctor questions are actually almost the same as the nurse questions. The only difference is they take, so took the word out nurse and they put doctor. Patients want the same thing from the doctor, which is to be treated with courtesy and respect, to be listened to carefully, and to be explained, to explain things in a way that patients can understand. And so our system, like a lot of systems, we have pretty similar results in these. Patients feel like they were treated with courtesy and respect. They feel like they were listened to carefully, but they do not feel like they were explained, that the information was explained in a way that they could understand. That is a big challenge for us. Um, a lot of it is, especially in an academic center, the comment I hear, and actually you'll see this on the surveys, is they feel like when we come in and round, that the doctor is talking to the other doctor, and then they leave. And so I hear this comment not infrequently. They'll say, you know, they come in and round at the bedside, but it's a doctor-to-doctor -doctor round, and then they leave. And so not saying everybody is doing that, but at our best, we're rounding with the patient there. When you sit down at the bedside, it makes a patient feel like you spent more time with them. Um, and so the things that we talked about doctors are the same things. I guess when I envision my, again, the medicine doctors that were the first people to ever teach me this, the, you picture them, I don't picture them standing over a patient and talking to them, sitting down at the bedside, introducing themselves. I can't tell you how many times people come into a room and don't introduce themselves. And as an ICU doctor, you'll see a doctor will come in, talk to the family, and then walk out. And then the first thing they say after the doctor walks out is, who was that? They don't say it to your face. They don't say, who are you? Or tell me your name. But as soon as you walk out, they'll say to the person left in the room, the doctor, the nurse, whoever, they'll say, who was that? And so, again, these basic things of sitting down, introducing yourself, um, and talk about the teach back method. Again, I like these really fundamental things. I'm a big believer that these are the same things we learn in medical school. If we do these things well, we don't have to have fancy new gadgets and those kinds of things to drive this in the inpatient setting. Um, the teach back method I learned in medical school, still use it, and I think it's important uh, in our practice. It makes patients feel that we spent the time, we can ensure that, that they got the questions answered, that we were explaining things in a way that they could understand. Also, when you start using it, um, you change a lot of your own practice. It's a good teacher for us. We get to realize the things that we aren't teaching our patients, the things that we could say better. So, um, And then also I'd like to put this in because this is the first, I think a lot of people's uh, textbook of physical diagnosis the first line of the first page says, good communication skills are the foundation of excellent medical care, right? And so again, just these fundamentals of medicine. So this, I'll tell you, uh, go into a little bit about how we did last year. And last year, I really talked to people about fundamentals. When I started last year, I came from clinical practice to do this last year. I went out and there was a lot of people with you know, decibel monitors at a nurse's station to try to monitor noise, all these kinds of things, but yet people weren't able to get to take the patients to the bathroom. And I was like, wow, well, wait a minute, like if we're going to do something, like coming from clinical practice, I didn't know all these nuances of patient surveys and satisfaction, but you just know, like, okay, probably getting to the bathroom is more important than a decibel meter at the nurse's station. So again, we tried to simplify in the nursing realm, in almost every realm, the physician realm, what do we need to do? And so last year we simplified, and then this is our results at the end of last year. We had improvement in almost every domain throughout the entire system. And I think a lot of that was due to people simplifying practice, going back to basics. This is about communication, getting to the bedside, treating your patients with courtesy and respect, especially when we're starting out. I think when you're at the 90th percentile nationally and you've got these ratings of you know, 95%, all these kinds of things. Then I think technological gadgets and all these things, I think, come into play. I think starting where we're at as a whole system, as a country, starting with these fundamentals and ensuring that the fundamentals happen 100% of the time rather than 30% of the time and then adding on something else. And so we made good progress throughout the system last year in all of our hospitals. You see this is all the uh, hospitals in our system. And then you see Cleveland Medical Center there at your right, all the way to the right, improved in every single domain last year. And so that's system results, too. You see we have some areas in the red. Um, and then this is Cleveland Medical Center's overall. So 
So you can see that there are some, these are the percent top box. Um, so this is, did the doctor always listen to you? Did the doctor always treat you with courtesy and respect? So uh, you can see that there are some percentages here that certainly we want to get better. But I think to take this big ship with all of these individuals and to make this progress, and you know, he's got 5,500 surveys, that was a significant <coughs> increase. Um, this was a big, big ship to move, and people really worked on it last year. And so how did this happen? I think this happened a lot because at the beginning of the year, nurses, we went to nursing first and said, how do we do this and what can we do? They changed a lot of practices and worked really hard on this. Kind of mid-year, maybe early to mid-year, we started to get physicians involved. And there were physician leaders that went on the floor with the nurses, started rounding, started taking ownership of the operations of that floor. And if you think about what medicine was like, you know, 30 years ago, that's what doctors did. They didn't just come in and see patients and leave. They were part of the medical operations. Like you owned a floor, you lived on a floor basically, and knew what was going on beyond just the diagnosis of each, of each patient. You were involved in the operations of the hospital. And so I think that's what really helped to move this forward uh, last year. And for Cleveland Medical Center, again, I, I think that this is amazing that this has even turned that big of a ship. Um, and so, again, not where we want to be ideally. We certainly understand that we want to have all these percentages, all of these experiences get better, but great work. Um, that's the percentiles. Again, you see that these percentiles from 2015, 2016 all increased. Um, I think they had all increased there. Uh, so there's the percentages, and this is basically how we're ranking the percentiles if you did a uh, rank, if you're graded on a curve, this is how we would look. So a lot of percentiles that we want to get better, um, but a step in the right direction last year. And then I put this slide up to uh, remind me to talk about, again, I don't, usually I'm not talking about so much about it from a financial perspective, but when I talk to physicians, they end up wanting to talk about this, and so I just put it in there. Um, but this is, again, how we get paid, and you see at the top there's a pediatric survey, and that's how the, the pediatricians and the inpatient, uh, like Rainbow, will be paid. They're on their way to being paid there. There's an outpatient ambulatory part of the, part of the reimbursement, emergency department, how, part of how the emergency visit is reimbursed. Inpatient psych, outpatient rehab, long-term care, da-da-da-da-da. You can just go on and list them all. It's a part of how providers are paid. Um, and so then this next uh, kind of section, what I will talk to you about are, um, the, we talked about how the doctors get paid and uh, how, the, how the satisfaction scores are. And this is a section about online reviews and so the transparency of patient comments in these surveys. And so if you look at the outpatient, not the outpatient, and the online, you try to search a doctor, which we think somewhere around 70 to 80% of patients do when they look for a provider, they search them online. There are all kinds of ratings that come up for doctors. And so when you look at these rating sites, they, they, you just, there's, you can't, I don't even know if you could put a number on them. You know, if you just Google it, there's, you know, you can come up with 40 or something right off the bat. Some of them are larger rating sites than others, like Health Grades and Vitals and Google and Yelp. I think Yelp has the most ratings for everything, including physicians. And so the question is, when you look at these, um, they, have just, they have varying standards of what comments they will put online for physicians. So if a patient sees you in the outpatient world or sometimes even in the inpatient world, they just can pick a doctor no matter what the venue, they put the patient feedback or they put the, I shouldn't even say the patient feedback, they put whoever wants to go online and post a comment about the physician, they put that up. And so the ones that have the highest end, the ones that have the highest amount of feedback is usually Yelp, I think Vitals, Google, Health Grades, those are kind of the big ones. What is interesting about these, though, and what you probably do know, is that there is no regulation around, was this actually your patient? Was this actually about you? And so a good example that I like to give is I have a friend of mine from medical school who's a neurosurgeon, we were talking about it, and he said, 
you know, posting these things online and, you know, talking about it. And I said, okay, let's look up your score. And so we went up, looked at his scores. He had like one vital score that was like a one star. And then we opened it up and looked at it and it said, she did this and she did that. And it wasn't even about him. And they don't even go through and say, hey, that's a male and they're talking about a female. Like, it's just whatever the person puts up is what they put up. And again, we think that probably around 75 to 80 percent of people go and and look at these. They Google somebody. The things that come up first are star ratings from all of these. And so, what have people done to combat that? And so, nationally, there is a trend where the patient feedback that we have, the patient feedback that hospital systems get, is they are starting to post that online to try to combat negative reviews. That's one reason they do it. Um, they try to do that to not only combat negative reviews, but to try to combat inaccurate reviews. So reviews, someone who's got a, one of their doctors that they think is probably a really good provider who's got one review, but the one review is bad and perhaps not even about him or her. Um, they do this in an effort to combat this. And so we, uh, as of February, started the same practice. So when you see an outpatient doctor in our system, <laughs> and you fill out the government survey and you write a comment, we take that comment about the physician and put it on our website and the star rating. And the difference is, is instead of if you have, if you've seen one patient and they didn't like you, we don't post that. We wait till you get about 30 reviews. So 30 is the number that really nationally is the standard and we followed suit. Some people have less, but we erred on the side of 30 because we feel like, okay, that at least gives you some type of representative sample of patients. And from that 30, you are calculated a star rating of how patients rate you, and also the feedback that they write about you, your visit, is posted online. And so we uh, post it and then keep it there for about six months. Um, and then what we do is before it's posted, all of the reviews are looked at by us. So every single comment, the thousands of comments that come in, they're all reviewed by us. And then we take out things for HIPAA, for profanity or for libel. And other than that, we post all of them. And so this is in an effort, again, to provide more accurate data, more robust data. And also, um, every system that has done this, um, Brigham and Women's has done it, Wake Forest has done it, University of Utah has done it, our, both of our competition locally has done it. We were actually the last on board with this. Um, the systems that do this, your overall patient satisfaction scores happen to increase. Um, but also, again, I think the biggest reason is that to combat inaccurate reviews, we know that people are looking for providers online. We know that they're searching information about you. What we want to do is provide the transparency and the accuracy information to them that we feel is more accurate. Um, and so the things that, oh, you actually have it there in yours, the things, the provider section <clears throat> on your right-hand side are the questions in green that are used to calculate the score. And when patients answer those questions and write comments, those are the comments that are posted online. And so we started doing this internally, and last summer we it's been talked about for a while in the system, and then last summer we started a communication plan with the doctors and said, hey, this is coming, hey, this is coming, hey, this is coming. And like a lot of doctor emails, you don't read it until it's there. Um, and so we didn't hear from a lot of people, but we did it through different types of methods of communication, like Dr. McGarrion's blog, sent different communications out from different leaders. Um, and then at the end of the year, we opened up an internal website on the intranet and posted all the physician comments internally to the doctors and said, look at your comments, review them, and let us know, you know, if you think that it's something is a violation. We've reviewed it for HIPAA and all these other things, but we said, you are actually the final double check. Review them for HIPAA, for liable, um, and uh, let us know. And so they looked at it for a few months, and then after something, after someone says, this is HIPAA, this is liable, if a physician feels like that that's the case, even if after it's reviewed by us, um, we have a transparency committee, and it's uh, Dr. Annabel, who's the chief of quality, chief medical officer of the system, chief of quality, Dr. Strosek, who's chief medical officer of Cleveland Medical Center, and me. And we go through, and our legal team helped us and are helping us, but initially and made sure we were, you know, right about our interpretation of liable, those kinds of things. 
and we looked at all the individual comments, and there weren't that many that people disputed, but um, there weren't many that actually fit those standards. So most of the time what people were objecting to was if people said the, the common comments that people make are the patients didn't feel listened to um, or they didn't feel like they were explained things in a way that the patient could understand. And so people would say, well, the physician would say that's liable because I did explain it in a way that it can understand, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's not actually liable because that's a patient's opinion. So that's how a patient interpreted that. And so whether or not you feel that that was the experience, the patient had a different experience, and the patient is entitled to have an opinion about the experience that they have. Um, those three standards that I talked about, the libel, the HIPAA, and the profanity, are the same standards that I can't think of a system that, a system that has any standards other than those three. Um, and so we went ahead with that and looked at those. And again, there weren't many that we said fit that standard. There were some that we initially screened out when someone said, you know, that like accused someone of like an egregious medical error or something like that. Those were all filtered out well before they got to the physicians. The ones we sent to physicians, we had pretty much vetted and felt comfortable with going out initially. So of the about 6,000 comments that we had initially, there were about, maybe about 100, maybe a little less than that that people objected to. And there were only a few that we didn't allow after those because, again, the vast majority were people not liking what the patients had to say, but not necessarily that they fit those standards of HIPAA or libel. They were like, oftentimes the physician just, you know, picked the HIPAA and then explained that they didn't agree with the patient, those kinds of things. Um, so, again, those went online. And then in February, we posted those externally. So February 1st, we let the physicians know that those were going to be posted externally on our external facing website. So now when you Google a physician, um, look for a provider, it used to be your vital score, your health grade score that came up first. Um, and if you now, let's see if I've got another, I actually pulled one up here to show you. So I Googled, again, I thought of a physician who would have a pretty robust N, who's Sean Hoyens, also he's a good doctor, um, one of our outpatient doctors. And this is what it looks like when you Google the provider and you see the star rating that comes up there. And you see, oh, he's got a UH, he's got his vitals there, which is 4.5 out of 5 and 5 out of 5. It's a good score overall. But And then if you click on him, this is his profile page. Not sure why these, maybe they're updating the website. Usually these are filled in, uh, the color's filled in there, but maybe they're updating the website. But you see underneath this picture there, he has 114 patient satisfaction ratings and 10 comments. And if you click on, you want to read the comments, here's his comments online. So all the reviews that came in um, are posted, the good, bad, and the indifferent, as long as they don't violate uh, those three rules. Um, so that says UH doctor profile. So this, um, again, uh, so again, I, in talking about this patient satisfaction, patient experience, we've had some doctors engaged with it. I didn't hear a lot from people, but after February 1st, I heard from a lot of doctors <laughs> about a lot of things. And the questions, so I actually got a lot of positive feedback and people, a lot of people said, why did you wait so long? Because the vast, vast majority of these patient comments are positive. The vast, vast majority of doctors have a high star rating. And so most people sent back the comment of, why did you wait so long? We did this a long time ago and when I used to work at X. And then there was the other, there was kind of that group of people and then there was a group of people that were dissatisfied with the process. And the people who were dissatisfied um, kind of fell into two groups uh, for me. One was they had a big N and they were dissatisfied, and one was they had a small N and they were dissatisfied. People with a small N usually had a good star rating, um, except in their comments, they only have one or two comments. So one comment was good, and the other comment, and I will be honest with you, was actually usually neutral, but you know, a lot of physicians are perfectionists, and unless it's a good comment, they really want to go to the mat about it, and I respect that. I mean, I respect the professionalism and the perfectionism, so I'm happy to discuss that. But 
it's really that was really the two the two groups on the people that were unhappy with it. So the other one was you had a big N and you were unhappy with it. And the people that had a you know a significant amount of returns, a significant a significant amount of comments who were unhappy with it, I haven't had anybody yet that didn't have a consistency in those comments. And so when you look at the comments, it would oftentimes, again, they were really about patient communication. They were about patients wanting to feel listened to. Patient didn't feel listened to. The next one was I didn't feel listened to. The other one was, you know, I brought in, you know, medic, medic, uh, uh, information about side effects, and the doctor didn't even look at them and told me not to worry about it. So, again, really a lot of consistency in those themes. So that was really the two uh, groups of people that, that I heard about from that. And so what we talked about was if you have a large N and you have a consistent theme, you know, it's time to look at your practice and think, is there something that I could be doing better? Like the first instinct is not necessarily right that we're saying, well, it must be the patient, it must be the patient. I'm not saying there aren't things that patients don't misinterpret, don't misunderstand. There are things that we can do better as a system to support the doctors. There are all these things. But if you have a consistency in the theme of your reviews about patient communication, that that's important to listen to. The other group that have a small N and they're upset about having one negative comment, I, I think of uh, one time I heard something about the First Amendment and they say, you know, you can take people to court and say, you know, you're not allowed to say this, you're not allowed to say this. People that support the First Amendment say the best way to combat free speech is by more speech. And so the best way, if you think that that comment is not representative of your work, is to get more comments. And so talking to patients, what people do that do this, uh, that have wanted to increase their N or wanted to uh, have those comments correctly, uh, accurately represent their work is they say just at the end of the visit. They say, hey, if you could make sure you return the survey, I'd appreciate it. It helps us take care of other patients better. You're going to be getting a survey. We don't want people to guide patients to giving a good rating because that's not who we want to be. We don't want this to be the surveys to represent work that we're not doing. Um, we want it to be an accurate represent representation of what we do so we can actually get better. So we talk to patients not about taking the survey and filling it out with, you know, a 10 out of 10 or a 5 star. We talk to patients about, hey, the survey is important. It gives us feedback. It helps us take care of all patients better. Please return it. So if you talk to patients about surveys, that's supposed to be the conversation around the survey. Um, so, and we've had people that have done this. and. Um, did this. This has kind of been the tactic around it, um, but there is uh, one provider in the system that I know of who's known for a while but did this and talked to all, all of his patients about it when they left, has had a not so great score because it was a low N, has a great score, and his N has, you know, completely increased because he's talked to patients about that. Um, when we think about patient experience and we, you know, this inpatient survey, outpatient comments, all these kinds of things, Again, I don't always talk about a vendor when I talk about the, the uh, you know, talking about how to make this better, but Prescani, um, because they just have this huge data set, has like take the data, taken the data, sliced it, diced it in every which way, and the three drivers patient experience, which is not that surprising to me after having done this for a while in this role, um, the what actually drives satisfaction measures of experience that are beyond the satisfaction scores. The things that drive that are the confidence in their clinician, and underneath this is communication. Um, the coordination of care, which is very important for us to think about, and I think in academic medicine, we need to do better, and we all know we need to do better. When you have a patient and you say, patient whose family talked to me about this very recently, whose mother passed away here, and they said one of the worst experiences was she was supposed to have, um, she was they went back and forth about a liver transplant, and then she said one day a doctor came in and said, talking about, it was a, the the nephrologist, and they said, oh, somebody told us that she needed a kidney transplant. The doctor nephrologist said, that, no, they don't need a kidney transplant. Whether or not this is true or not, this is what the patient interpreted. They don't need a uh, kidney transplant, da, da 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 Was it the doctor? I don't know if it was the medical student, the resident, the fellow, I have no idea. Said, no, they don't. No, they don't. They walked out of the room, and five minutes later came back and said, I'm sorry, she does need one. So that feeling of coordination of care 
so that when that goes well, the patient experience also goes well, so that when they feel all the doctors are on board, and again, we all had the experience where someone will order somebody, like the internist, the, the hospitalist, the, the attending physician will say, this is what's going to happen, and someone else will come in and say, well, they don't need that, and I don't know why they ordered that today. That, in fact, that makes patients feel unsafe, and they don't like that feeling. It doesn't feel honest to them. It makes them feel like the care is not coordinated, that people don't know what they're doing. Um, and then the empathy and listening, again, also patient communication. So those are kind of, you know, if you take this and kind of pull the lens back or pull the camera back, these are the things that patients want. So a lot of information. Are there any questions? I should have put it in here, but we um, we do, and uh, I, the, there were so many slides, so it was all disjointed because I wanted to put that transparency piece in because people have been talking about it, so I just kind of added that on last minute. But if you look at um, our big physician group, the UHPS group, they have had a uh, – I wish I had the graph. I don't have the graph. Um, it's a huge behemoth to move, right? It's like – 10,000 surveys a month. So to even move it a little bit is quite a bit. They've moved it a percent this year, which if you look at the graph over the years of all the things they've done, it like goes up and then it goes up a little bit, goes up a little bit. And that 1% compared is huge with that huge end. So that's the physician communication piece has moved pretty significantly just since this started, just since February since it started. So, and that is really what's happened in every system that's done it. And then the other thing that we look at is our web traffic. Um, if people are actually going to look at our reviews, you know, now that we have the stars up there, and we, that is increasing. We don't have enough data yet to say that it's exactly right, but that's, but that's increasing as well. Yeah. So the, the fear is that um, the fact that physicians are going to be rated like, you know, Airbnb or, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, travel velocity will make people change their practices. Give antibiotics to patients that can eat one, but you don't, or give give pain medicines, or you know, give intravenous sex reaction for Lyme disease, as an example. And um, is there any evidence any, that that is actually happening, or is this just all kind of you know anecdotal? Yeah, there is. Um, <clears throat> every now and then there will be like an anecdotal piece that comes out that supports that patient experience is bad for patient care. The vast, vast majority of the data shows that it's positive, um, and. You know, I sometimes, like when I first thought about this and I first talked to doctor groups, I like went into that data a lot and that kind of stuff, but after a while I was like, I don't know, like, it's like, did I feel listened to? And like, you can't really argue with those questions, number one. And then also, like the horse is out of the barn. Like, you're already being reviewed, you know. So whether we like it or not, the question is, how can we manage this and how can we do it with accuracy? So... Those are kind of my two thoughts. You think, I, I think this is a great question. I, I think that you know, a lot of young physicians here, you, know, you try to get into habits, right? So I, I'm running the carpet team. I don't know if team members know this. I, always, I almost always sit down in the room. And, and patients tend to think you're listening to them if you sit down. And they think you're spending more time with them if, if, if you sit down. So I always try to sit down around. I don't, I don't want to see if every, not every patient is the same. And then, you know, inpatient, outpatient, I don't always do this, but I always try to, you know, leave the room by saying, do you have any questions? Or do you understand what's going on? I think simple habits as, as clinicians that you sort of try to incorporate into your daily routines, you know. I'm yeah, sure and, you know, well, require, but, uh, and also, like, your example of ceftriaxin for Lyme disease, you know, would a patient be upset about that because they didn't get it or whatever? I'm sure every now and then that's probably the case. But when you look at the vast majority of what patients are saying when you're rounding on them, what's written in the surveys, it's that. I didn't feel listened to. Yeah. It's not about antibiotics. Every now and then there's somebody, for sure. But the vast, vast majority is about communication. I get patients who come to me, and ID doctors, who think they have Lyme disease and think, and I don't think they do. And, and having done this for 24 years now, I just I listen to them a lot, and I'm sympathetic a lot. And I try to go, and then and at the end, I think, I say, I don't think you need antibiotics. And usually if you listen to them and are very sympathetic toward their symptom complex, I've had one patient run out, but generally, yeah. she did do a survey. <laughs> you didn't run out to remind her about the survey? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, and again, that's why I guess it's just the surveys, I don't like the whole idea of, you know, everybody being judged on a survey, but it's one part of the puzzle. It's not the total puzzle. It's not the sum total of how you're getting paid, but for patients to have a voice, and again, I can't think of any great doctor that trained me that wasn't doing these things that was like, I don't care if they feel respected. Like, yeah, they've cared. It's been way med great medicine has been practiced forever. Yes. So right now, just like the quality metrics, they're under an attending physician name. And we only do outpatient because we can specifically track that a patient was seen by that doctor. We don't post inpatient data because I may take care of a patient for three weeks and take awful care of them and you discharge them, it goes under your name. So we don't, that's why we don't post inpatient because we can't accurately represent what's going on with an inpatient doctor at this point, just like the quality metrics. So, but yes. What are many projects we should think about for Douglas Moore is this to do residents to do the service. Oh, can't do work and then next week. Yes. I had a question about payment. So when I saw the pie chart that looked at efficiency and patient experience, I think sometimes despite our best efforts, it would run into each other. Yeah. So the, it, I don't, you know, I really know the data supports it, everything like that. Again, just these basic things, you would be shocked how many times, because you're busy. Sitting down, it's like sitting down, that can't make that much of a difference. And But think of how many times you have the time to do it, especially at night, you're on call, somebody comes and talks to you. I mean, but sitting down makes patients feel like you spent, and, and then when you start rounding, you see patients don't know who their doctor is that feeling of coordinated care, of knowing who it is. So that sitting down, actually introducing yourself, making eye contact with the patient, and then that teach back method because you learn so much from it. Those are the tips. Those are, I think they're very simple, but I think if rather than doing anything else higher level, some people do, some people are like, I always call a patient back and talk to them and discharge and I call and ask about their mother and that's great. I don't know if that really fits in the bandwidth of our time, but going back to these basics 100% of the time, that's the dream. Returning phone calls, particularly from the physician, is huge. And I've had patients who are seeing other physicians who change physicians because they, they didn't get their phone calls returned, or if it was an important topic, it was just, it, the doctor didn't call. And I know, again, it, it's hard to do everything, but like said, I know in outpatients, and, yeah, yeah, and and, and well, inpatient too. You know, your your mother's in the hospital for yeah a couple of weeks or something like that. It's her fifth admission this year. Well, I can't get there every day. I have to go to work, yeah. and so you never see the doctor. You never by the time you get there, the doctor is gone. I mean, the dream is talking to the family, not just this isn't you know I should say patient and family. It's always patient and family caregiver experience. Yes. Uh, well, sure. <laughs> the answer to that is yes. That's again. That's like that's like saying is anything being done about throughput. Everybody's thinking about it. Everybody's working on it. It's... Sorry. I can't hear you. Sorry. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. So, and the reason why that's in there is because that is, I think, in some way to instruct us that that's the patient standard. Like when you go ask patients, they talk to people, what is a long wait? 50 minutes, 50 minutes would be a dream for us, wouldn't it? Right, but that's the standard. That's what patients feel is long, right? Yeah, and yeah, you can tell them, and, and what we tell people is, you're going to get a survey, please fill it out, and usually the motivating reason people fill it out is they like to think that it's gonna help other people, so. You're going to get a survey when you go home, please fill it out. It helps us take care of other patients better. And then we don't direct them to fill it out, you know, with please let me know before you give us a one star. We don't say those kinds of things like my car dealer says when they send me the email. We, we want transparency. We want information. We want to be better, not to look better. It, 
It has to, oh yeah, some, yes, uh huh, yeah, there's lots of ways we try to remind people. So on their discharge paperwork, oftentimes there will be a reminder that says you're going to get a survey, please fill it out. It helps us take care of patients better. I want to thank Dr. Lutensa, really stimulating. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you.